Hi, and good afternoon from Optimal Performance Consultants in Toronto, Canada. And I am really looking forward to being able to deliver this um, unique talk to my to the listeners here at the Livable Canada uh, Environment Conference. A very exciting conference with a list of uh, what I'm glad to, to see our international speakers so that we can really get some different points of view in the area of design and architecture and uh, living at home, aging in place, some of these different terms that are used. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to the spending the next half hour with you and just bringing, as I say, a, a unique um, view to, uh, to design where we actually start to bring the person or the human back into, into the entire design process. So a bit of background about, uh, about me. Um, I am founder of Optimal Performance Consultants. I started the company about 30 years ago. Uh, at the time, I was a physiotherapist and I had worked with people with various disabilities from sensory to uh, Parkinson's, uh, age-related disabilities, um, sports-related disabilities. Uh, so pretty much across the board. And uh, when I set up my practice in ergonomics, the intention was actually to be able to uh, provide prevention um, for injuries, uh, human error, but also to be able to help design the workplace, whether that was manufacturing or uh, office environment or um, control rooms, the, the whole gamut of workplaces, such that we would be able to not just prevent injury from occurring, but to actually maximize human performance. Uh, so, and that's where the word human factors design comes in. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this talk together so that you can understand my background and ergonomics and a bit about human factors design and how that actually lends itself uh, completely to the design of homes. And you'll hear me talking about home offices as well. The reason being that that's a huge trend uh, in terms of people giving up some of their smaller spaces in urban centers. They're finding this in New York City, for example, other major centers, Toronto, Vancouver, uh, where people are selling their smaller spaces, realizing that they'll most likely be able to work from home at least two to three days a week, if not full time. Uh, it's been well proven over the last eight to nine months that in fact employees can uh, not only uh, be productive in the home office, but also um, have higher performance. Uh, the quality of life is also being reported uh, by employees as better in terms of being able to uh, deal with family a uh, little more closely, uh, but also giving up the commutes and in particular in large urban centers where commutes are problematic, um, including up to an hour of, of commuting time. So what I, what I want to do as per the title of my, my slide, which I'll also be bringing up onto, onto this talk, is to talk about how do we apply the science of ergonomics to architectural and design. Uh, often, and I will give some examples of when we haven't been included in that design process, what actually happens, anything from a loss of life in the manufacturing setting, all the way to uh, injuries or dissatisfaction with, with actual design. Uh, on the part of the, the human factor, the human being that's using that design. So I'll talk about what happens when that doesn't happen and what does it look like when the science of ergonomics is brought in very early on to the design process so that we can that make sure that design actually is centered around the human, the person. So what I wanted to start with in the first slide was actually to talk a little bit more about what ergonomics is. When people ask me what I do for a living and I say, I'm an ergonomist and I'm also a board certified physiotherapist, people will say, oh, it's about sitting up straight and then immediately change their posture or it's about a chair, right? That's actually very, very small part of what we do. When we talk about ergonomics and apply it properly, it's actually based on the entire human being. So what we do is we measure human capabilities. Can someone in a wheelchair actually manually and independently roll their wheelchair up a ramp? Can someone in a manufacturing setting actually apply the pressure or loads that they're required to do? 
but it's also cognitive. Can the job demands such that maybe someone is sitting behind a computer for eight hours a day with less uh, breaks or micro breaks or have a lot of work piled onto them that's quite complex, especially for knowledge workers. Can people actually do that? And is it sustainable or does it re result in some sort of uh, mental health issue? So in this slide, you'll notice that we define ergonomics as both all of those areas of the human factor, but also the environment and how it acts on the human factor. Does it help human performance, whether that's being able to reach cupboards uh, in a kitchen, in a home environment, um, or does it actually decrease human performance? Um, does it cause fatigue? Does it cause confusion? Does it cause human error to occur? So we look at things, uh, especially now during, uh, during COVID, we look at do people in their home offices and in their homes have good access to natural sunlight? Are they oriented in the right way to that sunlight? Do they have access to, uh, to fresh air? What's their HVAC system like? So believe it or not, that's what actually ergonomics is, is also about. It's much more all encompassing than what we think of. And of course, in that same infographic, we talk about lighting, we talk about noise, distractions, um, and in looking at the brain icon that is there, that's where we look at things such as sensory overload, or we can also underload the sensory system, uh, hearing, vision, uh, sense of, of touch, all of those things. So that's what we really look, look at in uh, ergonomics. So to help illustrate this a little bit better, and then I will bring it back so you can understand how what we do actually ties in very well with, with home environments, be it a condo, an apartment, or a house. Um, one of the things, some of the, the work that we've done is control rooms. So we provide ergonomic and human factors design as well as in employee education and training such that these are people that are looking at multiple screens, exactly what you can see in that slide with multiple screens, both in front of them and on the wall as, as well. One of the critical things with this per particular international security company is if human error occurs such that some information is missed or misinterpreted, that could actually result in loss of human life through robbery, et cetera. So really important that we understand the job demands. So what is it that the human being has to do? What do they need to accomplish? And again, use this in parallel in the home. Can someone reach into the cupboard to, to find an ingredient because they're, uh, they're cooking something? Or can we find information readily in a website? Uh, so it, it extends to all of these things. So in the case of the control room, we worked on anything from as simple as are they sitting in the right chair so that they've got good posture and they don't become fatigued or sore, all the way to developing the lighting system such that the light will change throughout the 12 hour shift when uh, the people need to have a little bit more alertness mentally, and we want to make sure that they're really able to focus. So it included what type of light, how the light changes through time. It also is break schedules, micro breaks, and then something as simple as providing people with the, the, the right uh, stretching and, and, and what is it that they do during their breaks in order to remain mentally alert. In the next slide, here we have someone on a manufacturer's uh, assembly line of motor vehicle, motor vehicles. So for several years, we have provided um, ergonomic and human factors advice in the auto sector. So specifically in a lot of the uh, auto manufacturers where they're actually making the entire car and in other cases making parts. So how does ergonomics work here? So when cars are actually being designed or redesigned by the engineers, we actually sit side by side with them and they may say, we have to change the orientation of the motor. Can someone actually reach in there and assemble that part of, of the engine? 
So we're able to measure that and say, no, they, they actually won't physically be able to apply that much pressure or no, no one can actually reach that far into, into, the, into the motor in order to assemble that part. So that's where we sit hand in hand, where the engineer, essentially a designer says, I'd love to have this design. And we're saying, well, that design looks great, but no one will be able to actually assemble it. And of course, if you think about it in manufacturing, they have to assemble, generally speaking, the, the car, that part of the car within 47 seconds. So that's another example of where we've uh, provided ergonomics and human factors design. Um, and so there's a model already in place where we work with the designers and the engineers such that we design uh, the car to look good, but also can it be built and can it be built safely and efficiently by, by the employee. So a bit of background. So now let's try to pull this together in terms of of the home environment condos and how we actually design for the human being, especially with people uh, moving into larger homes in the suburbs, uh, up at their cottages. Uh, there seems to be a trend out into rural areas and many people now wanting to make sure their homes, can I age through the life of that, that home? And can I also continue to work in the office irrespective of my age or if I develop a disability, for example. So in the next chart, what we're showing here is the majority of time when we're working in a workplace, we have to, by law, make sure that 75% of males, females can actually assemble a car or work in that security area or work in an office and not have too much uh, cognitive or um, things such as uh, distractions. Um, or too much mental overload. The difference is if we're into a home environment, all we're doing is we're taking that same science and that same da data about people's physiology, their capabilities, their cardiac abilities, vision, sight, and we just expand that so it's a larger part of the population. So we're looking at younger children all the way to older adults, people with disabilities. And don't forget, we have to make sure we don't focus too much on people in wheelchairs because uh, we're finding design is really focused on that when only about 5% of Canadians are actually in a wheelchair. So we've got to make sure that we start to look at the physiology and what's the impact for people with sensory disabilities an older person with glaucoma, someone who has become uh, deafened um, over time with, with age or they were born uh, deaf. So we need to actually look at the sensory part and also the mental health and cognitive part of things. So that's what that uh, particular slide is, is trying to emphasize for you. In the next slide, I wanted to actually share some of the data. We've been sitting on several committees and we've been invited to sit on task, force, task forces over the last several months through COVID to provide our input in the design community and in facility management and commercial um, management community to actually talk about where, where, what, what's actually happening. What will happen if people end up uh, staying at home, not commuting, working from their home environment? Um, are they going to be well served? Will they be able to produce in the same way that they did in their well designed um, office environments? So that's a question that's been coming up. So currently across North America, we have the majority of knowledge workers now working from a home, uh, from a home environment working remotely. And employees that we've interviewed directly through our ergonomic assessments or through the many surveys that have been released, such as through Leesman, is um, that majority of employees are saying, I think I want to continue to work from home and I think I can do that five days a week or perhaps a hybrid model. I'm going to be three to five, um, two to three days a week working from my home office where I need to have heads down work and I need to be able to focus and also be in my home and be able to move around and have different postures, et cetera. And then spend one to two days a week perhaps when I need to do any sort of collaboration or some mentoring or I need to meet with my manager. So 
that this is this, these are some of the statistics that I've reported. And certainly if you have an interest in, in some of the other trends and some of our direct data, because we're directly interviewing uh, employees, we're not just um, using surveys. So we're getting some interesting answers from employees that are quite different than what might be reported to managers and or to some of these uh, companies that, that collect this sort of, uh, sort of statistics. Um, so as an example in the slide, one in two people uh, won't uh, return to a job if they are actually told that they have to come back to work full time. So people are actually looking for jobs that will be more open to uh, allowing them to have a little bit more um, say in terms of where they work and what that work looks like. So right now about 70 percent of full-time workers in the U.S. and Canada are working from home through COVID. And of course, that's increased again now that we go into the next phase. So we need to be aware of that. And then also, if you talk to people who are experts in real estate, both commercial and in, in home environments and condos, is that they are finding uh, a bona fide trend where people are moving from smaller spaces saying, why not move to a larger home in the suburbs, in rural environments, in cottages? And then let's also make sure that my home, if we're going to move or renovate, will allow us to stay in the home through our, throughout the duration of our lives, irrespective of whether we're healthy or whether we develop a disability. And so there's a greater interest in that now. Uh, which I think also coincides with some of the changes to legislation such as the AODA in Ontario and the Federal Disabilities Act, where there's starting to be a little bit more understanding on the part of Canadians about the need to have a more inclusive design, irrespective of whether it's a movie theater, a sports venue, uh, a home office, uh, the workplace itself. And I think lastly, with uh, many of us, hundreds of thousands of us seeing the impact of COVID uh, in terms of illness and actual death and people in long-term care facilities, there's going to be a big drive for people to want to remain at home and have care come to them, but also to make sure that the home, including the home office, actually does allow them to age um, in the same place, irrespective of, of what health occurs and whether a disability occurs or as one of our auditors, uh, Jason uh, Childs, will often say is that, uh, remember that if we live long enough uh, that we will develop at least one disability in our lives. So essentially we are temporarily abled. Uh, so we have to bear that in mind as, as well, especially when we're healthy individuals and we're thinking that's, that's never gonna happen to me. Um, Jason happens to be in a wheelchair uh, as a result of an accident uh, with a mountain bike. And he certainly wasn't thinking that he would become disabled uh, when he went out uh, on his mountain bike for a nice little ride. So we really have to be cognizant of that with design. So the next couple of slides are going to show you what happens when we are not, so er ergonomics, the science of ergonomics and human factors design, what happens when it's not actually used in the design process? So what I'm showing you here is a couple different scenarios. The carpet uh, on the top left-hand side of the slide was actually used throughout a brand new building in downtown Toronto. Now it was determined by the interior design and architect that that was a really nice looking carpet, that it would lead people in a certain direction, bring them into the office environment. We weren't part of the early design. And had we been, we would have had a great deal to say about using that sort of design. When an older person enters that building or someone who has low vision, and remember, people that are deemed to be legally blind often have some level of vision, uh, whether it's from the periphery or the central part of the eyes. When they walk on that carpet, many of them report that they weren't sure if they were on a flat surface, was it a ramp, or were there stairs there? They couldn't differentiate that. For other people, they found that pattern quite confusing, and in fact, it caused dizziness. So we went in after the fact, which is often how ergonomics is used, unfortunately, and made recommendations about that carpet. 
Now, unfortunately, because it had just been placed, that's not going to be removed. It wouldn't, it would be cost prohibitive to do that. But what it meant is the designs in going forward meant that that sort of carpet, those sorts of designs would not be used again. Had we been brought in right at the very start, then that wouldn't have been a factor at all. And you also have to think about the employee experience and visitor experience in going to this brand new tower and seeing some of these designs that really didn't factor in the human component. To the right of that is a chair that we're starting to see many employees uh, who we provide virtual assessments for. Um, they are going out to office supply stores and purchasing. They love these chairs in particular because they're gaming chairs, they've got cool colors. The problem is, is those chairs cannot uh, be fitted to an individual specific size or what their job demands are. As a result, they're buying these chairs, $200, $250, think it's great, bring it home, and then find that they're actually having problems with it. They can't adapt it to their bodies and their requirements. Underneath that, really nice looking home office. It's got a nice clean look. Uh, the nice white lines and, and white furniture. However, it looks good. It's got the form checked off, but it lacks the function. And again, one, one reminder, I think that's important, and this may be the fault of ergonomics not talking to designers enough, is that when you bring the science of ergonomics and the human factor into a design process, we're not going to make it look like an orthopedic shoe. There's no reason why you can't have both form and function together. And that's a sign of really good design where you may not even notice that there's functional functional ease in its use. Um, and at the same time, it re really looks good. So we should be able to see the two things actually occurring at the same time. Lastly, you look in a home environment or a condo, you have uh, someone who's shorter in statue, statue. And if you look, especially in urban areas, we have a real diverse population throughout Canada in particular. So we have people from Asia, East Asia, who have different anthropometrics than you might in with a North American male where you tend to see taller males. So we really need to look at the anthropometrics and how is that being factored into the design of a home and to a home office environment. So really important to take, um, take a look at that and, and really start to bring the science of ergonomics into the design process. On the next slide, you'll notice that good things can happen when, when we're brought in, when ergonomics and human factors are brought in right at the start of the design, right when you're thinking about it. As a result, you get both form and function happening. So some of the, the slides that I've added here would be including in the kitchen, maybe making sure that the height of a bar or bar counter or the kitchen counter could actually be conducive to performing some paperwork. So if, again, if someone's working from home, we often tell them, well, just take your laptop or take your paperwork, bring that into the kitchen or to the bar and be able to stand for periods of time. It's a different, different look for you during the day, but it also gets you into, into a standing posture. Next slide shows someone being able to access natural sunlight and plants, um, a certain color wall, a different color of wall, so that their senses are actually stimulated, but they're also able to take a break from whatever task that they're doing. In the next two pictures, the one on the right, and then on the one on the bottom left, um, this goes to more of the traditional design that we think of in terms of chair and a workstation. But at the same time, we're also looking at, is there access to natural light? What kind of lighting is in, in that particular room? Can someone who's 65 years old read and see information as well as the 35 year old that might be using that room or a young child studying, um, studying at home? So can everyone use those spaces? And good design should allow anyone from a five-year-old that's, that's been given his, his uh, home assignment by his teacher all the way to the, to the 70 year old who's, who's uh, self-employed and, and still working. So we should be able to, to manage that range of people. 
gender, male, female, people of different sizes that we refer to as um, uh, anthropometrics. Um, can we make sure that people with any sort of sensory disability um, or even learning challenges be able to manage that environment and understand it um, and, and be able to, to enjoy the environment? Lastly, you'll see that there's a home gym. This is one of the employees who's now set themselves up uh, permanently in their home office. And they also wanted to make sure that there was a fitness component, but no matter how much they changed in terms of age and ability, that they would be able to still use that fitness equipment. And you may not be aware there is fitness equipment that can be purchased that actually allows people to, to use it irrespective of whether they have some sort of disability or a mobility issue um, or as they age and, and what their requirements are and how that changes. So we really need to look globally at the design. We need to look at what's going to happen in the home environment who's in that environment? Will they be able to grow up in the environment? Can you grow old in the environment? If your function and, and your abilities change at all, would you still be able to be safe, comfortable and effective in that environment? Turning to the next slide, um, this actually just outlines in a very simplified format, the process that's used. How, how do we actually engage um, the science of ergonomics and, and human factors? When, when should we actually bring someone in? So going back to that previous slide with the carpet, for example, or the employee that made their incorrect decision because they weren't given guidance about what sort of furniture or chair they should purchase for the home office. When should ergonomics be part of this? And is this going to interfere with our whole design process? Uh, so the answer to that is, is no, that if you team with the appropriate uh, group of experts, it should be that there's really good cohesion in terms of you've got the idea, idea as an architect or a designer, what the outcome should be. And then we bring the science saying, that's great, but you know, if we change the light to a different type of lighting, uh, then someone will be able to more readily be able to negotiate their stairs and we don't have to worry about those stairs anymore. So in the process and what works best is being able to use ergonomics right at the design phase. You're meeting with the client, you're meeting with the employee. They want to renovate their home. They're purchasing a new home a new condo, and they want to make sure, will I be able to spend my life here, irrespective of what happens? That's when you sit down as a team, because what we bring to, to this is being able to say, let's put the human at the center. Let's design for the person first. And as simple as that sounds, uh, that's often not the case. And in fact, one of the reasons why optimal performance has been around for so long is that we are brought in after the fact because the engineer didn't necessarily know how to design for the person or an architect wasn't sure, can a human being actually go up a ramp if it's a manual wheelchair? The answer of course is it depends. And that's where we can bring the science in. So we know um, it goes from just being, it depends to yes, in fact, the majority of people would be able to go around, up a ramp of this length um, and be able to do that independently without having to wait for someone or ask for assistance. So bringing us in right at the beginning, we talk about the human factor, we bring the science of uh, anthropometrics, physiology, biomechanics, cognition, all of those things together, and then match the environment to be able to maximize or optimize people's, uh, people's abilities. So Further on in that diagram, uh, then the design occurs, you try some mock-ups, uh, there's, there's the drawings, et cetera, and we're able to look at that and be able to say, okay, no, that we have to make a slight change there. Um, that stair height is actually gonna present a problem for, for this particular person. The other factor that's in here that's often forgotten about is when a design is actually installed, for lack of a better word, including furniture, equipment, um, technology, whether it's a TV or someone's computer or uh, an alarm system in the house, most people don't know how to operate it. 
So one of the missing things that needs to be brought into this as well is when someone moves into that environment, whether it's an office or manufacturing or their home, they need to be provided with both education, how or the why to use it a certain way, and then the how. Then that way people maximize the design and also the, the feedback from the individual um, is much more positive because they actually can use the majority of the design. Um, if you think of something as simple as being able to turn on the TV and change the station, a lot of that is really the information hasn't been presented to us so that we can just figure that out and have you know, the two different clickers and be able to, to manage that. So that's, a, that's an example of, um, of good design. And just to speak further about, uh, you know, the, the bringing the science of, of the human factor into this, uh, I've done a great deal of research over the last several years um, about uh, about ergonomics and about how to how to try to get uh, better design occurring for for human beings, whether they're an employee or a homeowner, condo owner. And there's several quotes I've noticed um, in looking at some of the architectural uh, literature and conferences and, and talks that have been given. So I've given the one quote here uh, from Frank uh, uh, Chimer. And um, in this particular case, in this slide, he says, people ignore design that ignores people. So if we take this, I mentioned earlier that there's new legislation, for example, that talks about the need to accommodate people. There isn't direct legislation that says you need to make sure that you design a home or renovate a home or renovate a condo, the public space in the condo or, or a condo owner's uh, condo. There's nothing that says you must make sure that uh, it's accessible. The Ontario Building Code is not very helpful either because that represents minimum standards. It actually does not, and I repeat, it does not result in the designs being accessible for people of all abilities. So it's important instead to look at this from the client's perspective. A client that sees that the design is, includes both form and function, that it's beautiful to look at, they can enjoy the space, but at the same time, it's got some really interesting functional attributes that make, makes things easy for them. Uh, that means that we've put the person at the center of the process. And those are the people that will keep coming back when they see good design, they will use that design. Um, they will tell other people about the excellent design. And people are also more willing to spend when they see the value of the design, that it's made them more comfortable. It's made them safer in their home, in their home office, uh, that it's made them more efficient, that they've noticed that their five-year-old child to their grandmother are able to use that design effectively and efficiently and safely, most importantly. So again, people will ignore design that ignores people. Prime example is we have at least 22% of the population in North America, um, also one the largest minority group in the world who have a large amount of money that they cannot spend because they can't get into environments. There's barriers, whether it's a home or a theater or a sports, um, places of worship, any sort of public spaces. If they can't access it, they can't be part of the economy either. So we really need to look at this as an economic question, one of uh, an ethical question, one of uh, mandatory governance, but most importantly, putting the person first. And I think if that's the what, what your takeaway is from this talk, then um, let's bring the science of ergonomics and human factors to design and let's start designing for the person. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference and thanks for listening. Take care.